In your bulletin, you should find a uh, sermon insert. It's marked a little different than the uh, title. It's uh, How to Grow, parentheses, Student Edition. If you would, pull that out. And uh, even, well, I could say this. I, I don't know about you. I, w when it comes to trying to figure something out like how to grow in Christ, I kind of like the kid stuff better than the adult stuff, you know what I'm saying? and kind of understand it, even a guy like me. So uh, this, this is a guide really for all of us. This, just, just simple, basic discipleship applies to your life, whoever you are, number one. But also uh, applies to your life as a, a grandparent, whether you're a dad or a, a grandma or um, a dad or a mom, uh, and you have influence on the child or a, a student leader, life group leader here. Uh, these principles apply all the way around. But number one, really to each of our lives. And so it's called the student edition, but uh, trust me, uh, the uh, points apply to uh, each of us. It covers the, um, what we've identified as means of grace that God uses to grow us. And where fathers come in, and moms and grandmas and life group leaders and others, uh, where we come in, our role is to inspire and help our boys and girls practice these means of grace. But it is Father's Day, so I'm going to hone in kind of on raising dads. That little boy, we need to see that little boy as a future father, statistically, maybe not, but at least he'll be a spiritual father in the church, and we need those. So that little boy, regardless of whether God calls him to marry or not, is going to become a father figure should the Lord grant him life and should the Lord tarry. So we're talking about raising fathers today, and though I'll use the word father a lot and boy a lot, uh, it does apply to girls, and it does apply, these principles do apply to all of us. Everybody good? Uh, and again, we get it. If you've had a bad dad, this is kind of, this can be a tough day. If you're from a fatherless home or you currently have a fatherless home, this can be a tough day. But again, this applies to uh, everybody today. We're not going to beat up on dads. As a matter of fact, let me just give a little disclaimer at the very front end. I want to make two statements, uh, uh, just kind of a privilege uh, that I have as a, uh, as a preacher here. Uh, one is, we're talking about, I don't know, most stuff I talk about like, I feel like a failure, just, just being honest with you, you know. And like, when it comes to being a dad, I think most of us dads, I can tell you certainly this dad, I feel like an absolute failure as a dad. It, it's, just, it's a daunting, ta I can't take care of my own sin nature, let alone these little bundles of sin nature uh, that the Lord entrusts to us. I mean, it's just a crazy hard job. And being a mom, you got to pick up where dad, you know, isn't, and it's hard on you too. I, we get it. So one, I feel like a, a failure as a dad. Uh, there's just always, you never enough time, always too much to do, always, you know, the tyranny of the urgent. And it's, it's a tough job, even if, we, if you got the time, it's a crazy hard job. And uh, on top of that, though, I want to say, by God's grace, and maybe God using my wife like a whole lot, Karen, my three, the three fathers that I admire the most are Ryan, David, and Jonathan. Of all the dads on the planet, those are the dads that I admire the most. And they're uh, really incredible examples of what it is to be a dad, I, I think mostly by the grace of God, which gives the rest of us guys, a little bit of a chance, uh, if, a, if God could pull this off through a guy like me, um, he can definitely do it through uh, somebody like you. And even if you're in the grandfatherly age, um, God wants to use you as an influence, and that's leadership, an influence in the life of your, your uh, grandchildren, and still probably in your children. So I admire Ryan, David, and Jonathan as men, period and I admire them as uh, dads. And one of my favorite things to do uh, wherever we find ourselves is um, kind of sitting back a little bit and observing how their kids admire their dads, how their kids respect their dads, how their kids love their dads. 
and the interaction and the affection. And I, uh, behind the scenes, I take uh, pictures on the ball field, wherever it is, of, of my kids coaching and all of that kind of thing. And so I'll just kind of just, you know, get phones today, you know. So I just squeeze off pictures. And my favorite pictures are flipping through these boys, these girls looking up to these three men with great admiration, and I look up to them as well. So that might be a little bit cheesy at the front edge, but it's a pastor privilege to be able to share that I admire my boys. They are incredible individuals, and it's, it's by the grace of God uh, that, you know, that's for sure. I don't deserve uh, the wife that I have. I don't deserve the boys that I have. And quite frankly, I, I don't deserve y'all. And I am just a, a guy that's just over the top, thankful, grateful for the grace of God allowing me to, to see what I'm able to see. All right, so we're looking at, uh, at how to grow. Uh, by, and I don't mean to leave out their wives, by the way. Those boys and girls might be the way. My grandkids, our grandkids might be the way they are primarily because of their wives. Uh, we have incredible daughter-in-laws as well. Um, how to grow. This is student edition. Our, our goal in this is to grow to become, each of us and together, each of us to become more and more like Jesus Christ. The goal of a parent, goal of a dad, is to focus that little child on the Lord from the earliest possible ages. And that child is saved, and this is really important theologically, biblically, that child is saved by placing faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, period. 100% grace zero effort on the part of the child, placing faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Uh, that shows that God has regenerated their heart, that they are alive. That's what we're shooting for from the earliest age. The Bible says we are justified by faith, made righteous by faith, given the gift of life by faith, and faith alone, and we don't add anything to that. But the Bible does not teach that we are sanctified by faith. I mean, on, on the one sense, the word sanctification means set apart. God sets us apart by grace. But in another sense, that word is used to becoming more and more and more like Jesus, being set apart from our, sin, our fallen nature and the pulls and the dictates of sin around us, uh, set apart more and more to a Christ-like life and practice. So using the word sanctification in that way, we are justified by faith, period. Bible does not teach that we're sanctified by faith, period. That's the core of it. But God has given to us means of grace, and using these means of grace, it takes great exertion and effort. Now, I know that sounds like heresy to some Baptists and others, but you need to look at your, at your Bible. Find me a passage that, that, that contradicts what I'm saying right now. So, there are means of grace, things we need to do with great effort because our fallen nature dictates, you know, pulls us away from these things in order to become more and more like Christ. Only God grows us, but He uses means that He has ordained to do so. So, our role as, um, as dads is to inspire by our example and help our young people from the earliest ages to trust Christ, number one, as Savior and Lord, number two, to use these means of grace whereby God will grow them. Everybody good? So with that, let's go ahead and proceed. Again, you should have this in your, uh, if you're listening online, uh, it's downloadable um, on the website. And if you're here, it is um, uh, marked as, um, what do we call this thing, How to Grow Student Edition. All right, pull that out, write on it, draw on it, and uh, let's dig in. Uh, Sixteen of these things, so uh, I'm going to go fairly swiftly. I uh, wish we had time to get to all the passages listed, but we'll do the first passage of each. Might mention another passage or two, only, only uh, very, very briefly, just because there's 16 of them. All right, so number one, first thing we start with, in, uh, as, as fathering our children, means of grace that we turn them on to, that we try to inspire them uh, to do and to help them to do. Number one is Bible meditation and application. There's really five words uh, that we can put with God's Word, the Bible. Uh, hear, they picture it as a sword, hear, read, study, memorize, 
meditate, the word we have in front of you, and then apply. All right, and that's how you use a sword. You can't just hold a sword with a pinky just by simply hearing God's word. Uh, that comes from the Billy Graham Association. I think it's a great way to uh, understand how we use God's word. Uh, we want to teach our children to memorize scripture and to meditate on it through the day and to apply it. The last thing we need to say to our children, follow, just follow your heart and everything will work out. That is satanic. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. They have a fallen, they, have the, they, they bear the image of God. They also have a fallen nature, and that nature can be very deceptive, especially when it's linked to what's going on in society around us. All right? Uh, they, are, they can be said to follow their conscience pray things through, but the conscience is gradually being renewed. How? As they spend time in the Word of God, bringing in truth and jettisoning, uh, getting rid of lies, all right? And so the Word of God is, is, is the only way that can happen. And so we have a passage in front of you that we um, used a week or two ago as we're going through how to leave a legacy. Second Timothy chapter uh, 3 and uh, verse 12, you have this in front of you. Uh, this is the context. All who live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Evil men and impostors will proceed from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. Uh, by the way, this is a different version than I have stuff memorized in. I usually use a different version in the sermons. This is the ESV. I, I use the NASV a lot, or Greek or Hebrew. And so I memorize. So uh, my, my quotes might be a little different than what's on the page. It's okay. Uh, it's pretty close. All right? So the context is um, it's going to be tough. Son, I want you to follow God's Word even if nobody else around you does as you learn it. And know that there's going to be some people that are going to give you a really hard time for doing. The entire group might say no to what you know is right. You do what's right anyway. Everybody good? That's what it is to be a man. You don't cave in to the group. You're a leader. As you follow Christ, you're asking others to follow you, and that's how you live. All right? You've got to be tough because it's going to be tough. And so uh, he goes on to say, Timothy, continue in the things you've learned and become convinced of. Uh, Timothy grew up with a mom and a grandma. His dad evidently was AWOL or not, you know, not around or not godly. And so his mom, his grandma had to uh, raise him in the things of God. And so can, Timothy, continue in those things. Uh, you've learned them and you become convinced of them. How? By living them out. You see God's hand at work. Continue in those things. From childhood, you, you have known the sacred writings. That's the Bible, which is, listen, able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. When we're having a devotional time with our children, we always want to ask the question when they're younger, did this help impart the wisdom that they need to lead them to salvation? What wisdom do they need? They need the bad news that they have a sinful nature and that they sin and the wages of sin is eternal punishment. God's not well pleased, and you'll be separated forever. That's the bad news. They need to understand that. If you have your devotional times and all you talk about is the image of God on the inside of them and how wonderful they are, they don't need a Savior, and you're not doing them any favor, all right? So number one, bad news. Number two, the good news. Jesus Christ paid the penalty of your sin, and you can use types and all throughout the whole Bible to teach this. Uh, we're always asking, does this help them, does this help give them the wisdom leading to salvation? And then the third point is, they need to make a choice, and that is place their faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. So, Timothy, you've known the sacred writings. They give you the wisdom leading to salvation when they're taught as they're intended. All Scripture is God-breathed and is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness that the man of God might be adequate, equipped for every good work. We want our boys to grow up to be fathers, should the Lord tarry and grant them life. And they are being trained in, notice the word, righteousness, 
as they're corrected, as they're affirmed through the Word of God, they become more and more righteous in practice, and they are equipped for every good work. What, what, what good works is that? Uh, Ephesians 2.10, um, uh, you are created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that you should walk in them. God has prepared good works for your children, for your sons, and, and, and becoming fathers, for them to be doing, they want to walk in the center of those good works. How can they do that? How can they live out uh, God's perfect design, live in the sweet, sweet spot of God's design? By studying God's Word daily and memorizing it and living it out. Everybody good? And so how do we do that as dad? How do we inspire them? We've got to set the example. I, I've got to ask each of us right now, dads and granddads, do your children, your, the future fathers in your family, do they see you studying God's Word? Do they hear you talking about God's Word? We have to set the example. And moms can do all kinds of work. God's just kind of designed it in boys, and I hate, I hate to say this. And if you're a single mom, the church comes around you and helps you. We want to help you out. Um, and, and God can use you. And Timothy, you know, mom and a grandma, okay, and, and he became an incredible man of God uh, without his dad. And so it, it can certainly happen. It's just a lot harder. Boys look up to their dads. And if their dad is not excited about the Word of God, about the God uh, behind the Word, and therefore the Word of God, and focusing on God, it's, it's, it's unlikely the boy's going to be. Just throwing it out there. So what do your kids see? That's what we need to be doing. And those other passages uh, that are before you speak about how God's Word performs its work in us. All right? Number two, prayer and worship. Um, is this the attitude that I bring home in the evening after a day of work, dads, to display to those little boys that are becoming fathers. This is in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 16. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Do not quench the Spirit. All right? Now, this is uh, the conduct, the flow of thought here is just a uh, kind of a litany of things that we need to be doing as believers. It, it kind of brings uh, uh, the end of uh, the, the letter of the, uh, written to the Thessalonians, kind of, kind of brings it in for a landing. And so there's a number of things uh, that we need to be practicing in the Christian life. This is uh, one little section of that. Rejoice always means what? We're worshiping. We're thankful. We're, we're filled with joy all the time. We, we can be sorrowful yet always rejoicing according to Paul in, uh, in uh, Corinthians, all right? So we, we can be real. We want to be real. Uh, we can be broken. We can be sorrowful. But there's always a, a, a detection of a spirit of joy even when we're fighting the worst condition possible. There's always something to, to, to worship God for. And so uh, we want our kids to see that. We want to inspire that in our children. Pray without ceasing. That means practice the presence of God. He's always present. Prayer is mostly listening for the voice of God, and giving thanks in all circumstances. Whatever's going on, there are so many things to give God thanks for uh, that will help mitigate the pain of the uh, loss, the grief, whatever we're struggling with. So I've got to ask myself the question, do I bring this attitude as a spiritual leader in my home? Do my kids see me rejoicing no matter what? Um, when they come to a, a, a soccer game uh, or a football game or whatever, football's fixing to start up at the community center, you know, um, do they see me, um, how do they see me respond when the team loses or when I flub up, which is like a lot and more and more as I get older, can't hardly stand up anymore, you know, walker. Uh, yeah, wh how do I respond? What do they see? How, how does a person react to tough things? How do our, and our boys uh, and, and girls, uh, quite frankly, at the community center, react pretty well when they, when they face the tough losses, especially in the playoffs. Uh, they, they do pretty well. Those are great teaching times. Um, and uh, sometimes, I mean, you feel like you're not an athlete, you don't understand this, but sometimes you, you flub up, you lose the game for the team. I don't know what that's like, but I'm just saying I've seen it happen. Um, you, you know, and you, and you just want to punch yourself in the mouth. I mean, you just like, you feel horrible. But what, what you got to do as a Christian is slap yourself and go, wait a second. There's always things to rejoice about. 
The next phrase, there's, there's, I want to be listening, prayer. I want to be listening for the voice of God at this moment. God's using this moment to do something in me and through me. Set an example. And then give thanks. I, I'm able to see. I'm able still to, 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 to move. I have a body. I have a brain. I, I, you know, I, I'm still here in this, in this environment. More chances later. There's so many things. And we've got to help our young. The, the great teachable moments are after they lose the game, the big game. Second two, great teachable moments after they win the big game. And pride is just rearing its head, right? So uh, always teachable moments. Uh, so prayer and worship, practicing the presence of God. We want to set that example. We want to guide our kids into it as well. Uh, other great passages listed for you, how to pray, how to walk in the presence of God are listed. Uh, number three, stewardship and simplicity. Simplicity means living a life where we're not bogged down with all this stuff we got to keep repairing and, and maintenance, and I, I, I'm, I'm just committed to living as simple a life as possible. I don't want to, I, I like for my friends to have stuff. I don't want to have a bunch of stuff because I don't want to have to deal with it. I want to focus on my wife, on my God, ministry, people, and, and yeah, got to have a house, and it's a pain in the neck, but you know, you got you to have certain things in this society. Beyond that, I don't want to have a bunch of stuff because I want to be free what do my kids see in me as I, when, when my kids were younger? What did they see? Did they see me got to get more stuff, or did they see me free to be able to serve others? And nobody here judges anybody. You've got a lot of stuff. God's blessed you with a ton of stuff. Yeah, good for you. We, we celebrate God's blessing upon you. But dads, really think about you know, stuff isn't evil and money isn't evil. It's the love of it that is. It's, it's when it just, it just sucks the life out of us and, and guides us to it over against... How many of us spend time on our stuff over against our kids? Right? You know what I'm saying? So, so a simple lifestyle. Am I setting that example for my kids? Stewardship. We need to sit down with them and help them understand Matthew 6, verse 19, Jesus' words. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust don't destroy, where thieves don't break and steal, for where your treasure is, that's where your heart will be also. Your heart will follow your investment. Don't kid yourself. If you want to be in love, son, if you want to be in love with God, invest in him. Our, our boys, and the, the very last passage that, uh, listed, uh, I think, for you is Matthew 23, 23. Make a suggestion. That's about tithing. Uh, well, let me just give you the passage, and then we'll apply it. Um, Jesus was uh, uh, given the, uh, correcting the, the, the religious leaders, and one of the corrections was, Woe to you, scribes and, and Pharisees, you hypocrites, for you tithe, that means give one-tenth to God, uh, you tithe mint and dill and cumin, little seeds, but you've neglected the weightier matters of the law, justice, mercy, and faithfulness. These you should have done without neglecting the former. In other words, it's right for you to tithe. This is still the Old Testament, by the way. It's right for you to tithe in the Old Testament economy that we're in, but you want to go beyond that. What does justice and mercy and faithfulness require of you regarding your finance and, and your property? That's what you want to be living out. So it's, a, it's not a law in the New Testament to tithe, but it is a principle. And the reason we say that is every law in the Old Testament um, that has some application in the New Testament, like giving, it's always accentuated in the New Testament, never deleted, ever. All of it, it's always eccentric. So, so we suggest to you very strongly that there's a principle of the tithe that you want to teach to your boys and girls from knee high to a duck. When they get a dollar for their birthday or whatever, it, to teach them 10 cents at least goes in the offering plate, and another 10 cents at least goes to supporting you when you're old. Seriously, you, you're going to put it away absolutely seriously, you got two ten cents is coming out of that thing, and just start doing that as you mow lawns, whatever it is, all the way through. Just teach them the way they can never remember they didn't do this, to tithe and to put away 10% uh, uh, for retirement. 
And they will not be a problem in retirement. Should the Lord grant uh, America the, the current direction? They won't be a problem in retirement. They'll be an incredible blessing to so many other people financially along with uh, their lives. And they will be uh, independently wealthy early on and be, have a lot more time for ministry. Just throwing it out. All right? So that's stewardship and simplicity. Um, next one, number four. Uh, those, are, those are things that we do um, individually. We don't want to tell each other what we give. We don't want to tell each other, um, you know, about the, the, those, those three things uh, for the most part. Uh, we don't show those things off at least. We, don't, we do those on our own. But now these we need to do with other people. So number four is this is the relational stuff. You need other people to do this stuff with. Uh, the, for, for children, obviously the first three, your, the parents are helping them do these things. As they get older, they do them on their own. Number four, under the relational stuff now, parents and family. Uh, parents, dads, we want to be uh, conducting our homes in a Shema kind of way. What is the Shema? Glad you asked. This is of uh, Deuteronomy chapter 6 and really verse 1 and following, but verse 4 is where we pick it up here. Uh, this is God instructing uh, the dads in the uh, Israeli economy as they're heading for the promised land. Uh, how to conduct their homes. And so to dads, he says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. That's the starting place. In your home, there needs to be love for God. That's the number one starting place in a home. A value for God. Love, value. A value for God. God is the most valuable person in our home. We're talking about him all the time. We're honoring him all the time. We're following his word all the time. He is what our home is all about. Our home is a little bit of heaven. God is in charge. We want his glory to fill this place. That's what a dad does in his home. Love or value the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. That's what means on everything on the inside, dads. We're setting that example. And these words, so that you get the one true God and don't make up a God of your imagination, these words shall be on your heart, and you shall teach them diligently to your children, all the time looking for ways to teach God's word. And you shall talk about them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, when you rise up, all the time looking for opportunities to apply God's word to what we are seeing, including soccer, including driving to the, uh, to the beach, whatever it may be. We're always talking about the application of God's word in everything we see, all right? We're practicing the presence of God. This is real family life. We teach. God's perspective, we teach God's love for people, honoring people, spirit of worship, thankfulness, opportunities for ministry, just always, always, always applying God's Word. Deuteronomy 5, by the way, a passage listed, is honor your father and your mother. In other words, as they teach you. And then Ephesians chapter 6, also listed, is um, uh, obey your parents, honor your father and your mother. And uh, so as they teach you, listen to them. And fathers, don't provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. By the way, uh, a good read for dads uh, for homework is uh, especially the beginning Proverbs, Proverbs 1 through 8 or 1 through 9, maybe 1 through 10. Uh, so many places, son, sit down and listen. Listen. Listen to instruction. And beyond my instruction is number five, seek godly leaders. And that's where we, we pick up number five. But, but uh, Proverbs, so much of Proverbs is about uh, dads teaching their, their sons what it is to be a godly man, what it is to be a godly father and a godly husband and a godly place and uh, a, a person in the workforce. All right? Uh, so that's a great read, just Proverbs. Just start with, with chapter one. Uh, number five. Uh, everybody having a good time so far? Uh, this, this is, again, this is stuff for all of us to live out, but we want to instill this in our children. Uh, number five, and we'll get as far as we get, because you you're all are, are, are astute people. You're able to read, so I'm just going to leave off on whatever I need to leave off on. Uh, number five, seeking wisdom from wise leaders. We want to raise our boys, we want to raise our children. Study leaders. 
Study godly leaders, but study all leaders. Who's a leader? Somebody who is influencing others, not because others are paid to be influenced by the person, but because the others are choosing to listen and follow. Watch your coaches. Why, why are some coaches listened to and other coaches just blown off? Why is that? What's, 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 what's the dynamic? Study, son, study leaders and study especially godly leaders, leaders in the Bible, biographies of godly men and women uh, throughout church history. Study leaders. What was it that God used in their lives to lead, to influence others? And so we have these words in uh, Proverbs. This is Proverbs chapter 1, verse 5. So many passages in Proverbs about this. We could spend uh, weeks on this. Proverbs 1, 5. Let the, and this is a dad talking to a son. Let the wise hear and increase in learning. What's he saying? Listen to godly leaders, wise godly leaders, and increase in your learning. And the one who understands, obtain guidance. If you have understanding already, obtain more guidance. Listen now, this is, this is really important. To, under, to be able, as I did, to be able to understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles. When wise people get together, it's not that they talk in riddles to each other. It's just they talk in such a way, such a strong, for our, our, our uh, venue, in such a strong biblical way that if you're a goofball and you've never listened to wise people teach Scripture, including your dad, you're not going to understand what they're talking about. And son, you want to understand what wise people are saying. And so at the earliest possible age, you need to listen to wise people. And we have wise, godly people here in this congregation, along with you, dad. And we've got wise, godly people, if you're careful, online. There's, there's gazillions of them. And there's those in your neighborhood and in your family as well. We want to make sure they're godly and they truly are biblically wise, but we want our children, age-appropriate levels, we want our children to be listening to wisdom because what are they going to do? They're going to follow this entertainment-saturated society. We, we just got to be entertained all the time now. You, you, the older guys here, you didn't grow up that way. I mean, you played ball and you did stuff, but th today... It's got to be, i got to have my phone. If I, if I lose my phone, I, I'm going to just, I'm going to die. You know what I'm talking about. And, and it's got to be entertainment. It's all, everything's entertainment. I don't, I don't need my phone to learn, which is what I wish you would do with your phone. I need phone for, for entertainment. i got to be entertained day and night all the time. And that's where our society is. And dads, if we're wise, we've got, we've got, to, be, we've got to tune into that. It's going to kill our kids. America still needs some wise kids. The kingdom needs some wise kids. And we've got to teach our kids. You could have some fun. We, we all have, you know, uh, some entertainment. But for the, we want to be focused on wisdom. Learn, learn, learn. How, dads, how can we inspire our children to want to learn, especially godly things? Well, there it is again. We need to set the example. And we need to talk about how we are learning. So I was studying this today, I was studying that today, in the Word of God or in science or in politics, whatever it is, whatever age you know, they, they are. Uh, talk about how you're learning and, and show excitement about learning and how they can learn as well about uh, God's world and about how to live in this world. A few Proverbs to uh, throw at you, Proverbs 11, verse 14. Where there is no guidance, the people fail. In an abundance of counselors, there is victory. These are listed for you uh, on, your, uh, on, on your outline. Abundance of, count, and abundance of godly counselors who are the last, uh, I've, I forgot to read this in Proverbs 5, uh, 1, 5 through 7. The last line is, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge or wisdom. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. The point is, we want to be listening to people 
Wise people, how can we know they're wise? Because at least they have the fear of the Lord. What does that mean? There's a deep respect exuding from them, uh, a deep respect for God. That's who we want to listen to. Folks who have a deep respect for Yahweh, the God of the Bible, not, not a God of some imagination. All right? So those folks, where there's abundance of those folks, there is going to be victory. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 15. A wise man is he who listens to counsel. Get counsel on all the important decisions and on just learning in general. With many counselors, plans succeed. Without it, they are frustrated. Proverbs 19, verse 20, listen to counsel, accept discipline. Sometimes the wise will bring correction in your life. Be thankful for that, that you may be wise the rest of your days. So many other Proverbs guide us to guide our young people to seek godly wisdom. Too many American males today, uh, I'm not going to get advice from anybody about anything. I'm a guy. Seek out godly men. Show your son that example, and you and your son, your future uh, uh, dad of your grandchildren will be the better for it. Maybe one or two more, and we'll call it good. Number six is friendships. Obviously, we want our children to hang out with godly friends. This is obviously huge. I think this church does a... The, I, 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 by the way, I admire the parents in this church. And I think overall uh, they do a good example of working together and, um, and they're pretty careful about who their children hang out with and I admire that greatly. Uh, Acts chapter 2 verse 40 and following. With many other, this is, this is the beginning of the church. God, God could have done things any number of ways. And so, so uh, Jesus has, has just paid the penalty of people's sins on his body on the cross. He's died, rose again. Forty days later, hung, hung around here, and then went back to heaven. And then he leaves a bunch of uh, believers, 120. Um, and then God pours out his spirit on them. And uh, we have the church started uh, by God working through a sermon and uh, the miraculous, and 3,000 folks are saved. And God could have said to them, now y'all, it's just between, you know, Christianity is just between you and God. Just go back, just go back home, go back to your jobs, go back wherever you are, and just, just you and God, that's all you need. That's not what the Lord did. The Lord kept people right there, and they had to sell properties and possessions and, 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 and numerous families in the same house together, and they had to do, and many of them, most of them probably lost their jobs, and they did life together in community, and that's God's design. Not that we all need to sell our houses, uh, but if we needed to in order to stay together, that's what we would do, okay? And so uh, that's the context of verse 40. With many other words, uh, Peter uh, bore witness and continued to exhort them, saying, listen now, save yourselves from this crooked or corrupt generation. In other words, come out of this generation and join us in community. Become our friends. We're going to be 3,000 friends doing life together. Added to their group was 3,000 folks that day. They devoted themselves to teaching, to fellowship, that's sharing life, doing life together, to the breaking of the bread, that's probably the Lord's Supper, probably, and to prayer, praying together. They were friends together. Not everybody knew all 3,000, obviously, I assume, uh, but they were together. The Lord didn't take them, just of note, though, out into the desert like the Essenes. He kept them in the center of Jerusalem where they could be a witness to lost people and end up being persecuted pretty badly while they were there and eventually would have to flee even that city, at least many of them, all right? But that was God's plan to keep them together. So we need, God's point is, God's designed for us to need friends. He's designed for your children to need friends, and they want to uh, make sure that they are godly friends who are fleeing from the crooked generation to the people of God. How do we do that? Uh, we don't bring home that goofball. I mean, if you've got a guy you're witnessing to, be careful with who you bring home, obviously, men. Uh, but we want to show our kids that we are discerning in our friendships as well. 
Amen. And by the way, number seven, partnerships is really the same thing. It's just partnership is going to be like your, like your best friend or your best two friends, people you can really be intimate with. And so you want to be wise in choosing them. Um, and so do our, so I can take uh, six and seven together. You know, dads do, uh, what do my kids, what do my grandkids see in me? Am I wise in the friends that I hang out with? Or am I just hanging out with, with, with guys that are morally goofy or worse? Who, who, who you know, I want, to, I want them to see me witness to the worst of people. But as far as who I hang out with, who am I hanging with? Who, what do my friends think? Uh, my, my friends, my, my, my children. What, who do they think I'm hanging with when I just am with, with friends? Who do I invite over to the uh, football game? Unless, again, it might be somebody that I'm... And I'm witnessing to, and then I want to explain that to them, exactly what's going on. But I'm not going to be, we're not going to be influenced by that guy, all right? So we call that partnerships. Uh, everybody needs uh, partners. Everybody needs just a large group of friends. That's the church and beyond. And partners are just those one or two or three uh, really close, intimate pe- people you can be really intimate with that you can trust. You want to be careful with that. Uh, Mark chapter 6, verse 7, when Jesus sent out the disciples, he sent them out two by two, not individually. All right? And then uh, one more, and we'll call it good today. And James, I'm going to have you come back up here in a moment, but let's, let's, uh, let's uh, do a number, number eight. Small groups. You know what? Let's not do that. I'm just going to take you. Here's what we're going to do. I'm just going to um, take you through what the others are and then send you home with the homework to study each of them as a, uh, as a couple together and to talk about the plan to instill these things in your children. You'll be able to identify them as I go. So we're just going to do this way. Number eight is small groups. Um, and I do want to read this one passage, though. This is going to be, the, this is going to be hard. Uh, this is out of Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24. Let us consider how we may stir one another up to love and good deeds, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as is the habit of some, but coming together and encouraging each other and all the more as you see the day approaching. Let us consider how to encourage one another, stir up one another to love and good deeds. You know a good conversation to have with the kids on Saturday night? Son, we're going to be in the assembly tomorrow. What is your game plan for encouraging somebody else there? Pull out the directory. List of children's names, list of adults' names. Might be a senior. When we go tomorrow, who are you focused on? And especially when you're in your small group, because you'll have more time there. When you're in your small group, and, and please don't have your children miss small groups. That, that's really troubling to me. I just, I'm just i going to throw it out. It's really, really troubling to me when we skate. I'm not judging you, but I'm just saying when it happens over and over and over again, we're letting young people just skate. They need to come to this passage and go, well, I'm, I can't s- s- escape the small group. I, I, it's not that, that, that I need to go or that... that I need to be there to encourage somebody. That's what I'm trying to say, okay? This is a call to ministry. This is an opportunity for ministry. And so, son, daughter, what is your plan tomorrow during small group time to encourage one of the children in your group that, that maybe is going through a hard time? It might just be just to give them a hug. Maybe, maybe that's all you can do because you don't want to babble about stuff. You know? but, but who is it that's, that's wrestling with something, and what are you going to do? And so that's fulfilling the command, consider how to encourage one another unto love and good deeds. Meet together. Don't neglect that. Encourage one another in these small groups. And I say it's small groups because you can't really do it in a large group like this. All right? Uh, so <laughs> I'm just going to speed through these things. These things uh, James, we're going to be with you in a moment. Number nine, um, helping God's family. Again, that's another thing that we take the directory out. Who as a family, who as an individual can we come alongside and help? Maybe a senior or somebody in need. Uh, Steve, did the, Steve took the youth out recently a number of different days and helped different seniors. That's beautiful. It's incredible. That's what the church is. Uh, we can do that as individuals and as families as well. A father-son can do that. 
with somebody. We're glad to help you with, uh, with names of people that might could use a hand or a visit. Uh, number 10, helping God's family in other places in the world. This is the persecuted church, and uh, we need to uh, be about remembering them and teaching our young people uh, to remember them. You have family members, you actually have family members uh, that are in prison right now for being Christians. Um, and maybe we'll have more information on that later, um, how, how we can uh, help our families, help our children understand the persecuted church. So that's a note for the persecuted church folks that are listening. Number 11, uh, outreach. Um, we want to love people, serve people, and share the gospel with people. My, my kids were in Miami, a pretty tough neighborhood, um, a really tough neighborhood. Like people died there. Um, we, were, we, we pounded on every door in the, in the, in the, in the area. Uh, for miles. And my kids on Saturday morning or other play times, you know, they were with me pounding on doors. And typically, I take them one at a time. Uh, but they were with me knocking on doors, and they would see me affronted, and they would see people ex accept the gospel as well. And, and they never rec you'll never recover from that. I'm not asking you to take your kids door to door in a tough neighborhood. I'm just saying um, to give them, you know, to, to carry tracks with you. I got my... Uh, little sending device here so it's hard to reach because I, I have my tracks in, in my left pocket normally so I can shake hands with this hand at the same time be reaching for my my weapon okay and so we we have uh, you know the greatest gift track which which very simple track John 3 16 through 18 um, which kids can can give out it's hard for an adult can reject an old guy can reject a track from me but they're not going to from your young man they're going to take it and it's really healthy for them. And then sh learn how to share the gospel at the earliest age possible with their friends and whoever else, family members. Uh, number 12, supporting missions. Uh, we have the Bannock family here. It'd be good to come alongside them uh, for our kids to get to know them and how they can maybe write letters and pray for them during their year and even financially give. We talked about giving uh, uh, beyond a tithe, and that would be a way to do it. Just mark uh, the other, you know, three cents, uh, five cents, mark it the Bannock family, all right? Uh, it, put, it puts their heart uh, into missions. Uh, number um, 13, now we're doing uh, providential stuff. That was, we did the personal stuff, we did relational means of grace, and now the last four are providential. This is stuff that God does uh, that we just need to respond in a right way to. We, we respond in trust, worship, thankfulness, obedience when these things come down the pike by the hand of God or God allowing them. Some of it's fun stuff, and God uses fun stuff to uh, help direct our attention to Him and be thankful during uh, the experience of fun stuff. Number 14 is painful stuff, and God can use painful stuff to bring discipline in our life and to grow us, there's some passages uh, regarding that. Number 15 is temptation, you know, when you're tempted to get angry, uh, when you're tempted to freak out, when you're tempted to hate, when you're tempted to not forgive, all of that kind, all of that's your friend. It's, it's like lifting weights. That's all your friend, son. You want to choose God's way, and you will grow rapidly as you do. And then number 16, the last one is uh, uh, persecution. If you feel like we've left out something, by the way, let us know. Uh, we might put the Lord's Supper in here, um, which I meant to do and didn't, didn't uh, get it done. But anyway, um, number 16 is persecution, and that is uh, God allows people to give us a really hard time. And uh, through that hard time, God's going to, um, gonna, going to grow us if we respond in a right and good and biblical way. All right. So these are, James, if you would, come on up. Uh, these are all important means that God uses in our lives, each of us. Just take this list as a checklist for your own personal life. But then, you know, uh, a checklist for raising children. Uh, this, some of these things will apply during vacation Bible school if you're part, uh, helping lead the children in that. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for this great privilege to be able to have gathered today and uh, to be uh, entrusted children. Uh, thank you, Father, for each child and for the privilege to be able to uh, come alongside them. Uh, they all belong to you. Uh, they're your creation. We're just given a stewardship. And uh, we pray that uh, you would guide our moms and our dads uh, to walk alongside their children in such a way to guide them into these means that you use to grow them. Most of all, Father, we pray that all of our young people would come to the saving knowledge of Christ at the earliest possible age. Thank you for the privilege. 
to be entrusted with uh, these uh, really incredible young people and uh, be inspired by the parents and the grandparents uh, that we have in this congregation. Play for your the fullness of blessing on each one. If you would uh, stand and uh, let's worship the Lord with a, uh, about a verse and a chorus. This area is open. If you want prayer regarding anything, go ahead and come on down, especially if you want to trust Christ as your Savior and Lord.
Oh, 